I'm not sure how loud this is going to be. Okay, good. You know, you hate to yell into these things. Thank you all for coming to our first annual. Can you say that? It's probably the first ever. We'll see next year if it's, this was the first annual. It's a retrospective perspective. So um, uh, Metadata Lab here at uh, Content and Context. Um, my name is Michael J. Um, I'm president of Educational Systemics, and uh, uh, we're, my organization is working with AEP to support the proof of concept um, behind LRMI. Um, and uh, I'll certainly uh, speak more to that. Um, for those of you, uh, I'm just curious, how many of you are here just for the Metadata Lab? Just for the Metadata Lab. Wow, how cool is that? So, um, and uh, I'm, I'm, that's really exciting. I mean, it's, you know, somebody said, oh, it's just like about metadata. I don't know about you. I get turned on by metadata. I think it's very cool. So, um, so that tells you how nerdly I am. Um, but, uh, but it's nice to be amongst uh, 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 some of my kin uh, folk here. So thank you so much for coming. For those of you who weren't aware, I mean, there is a much larger uh, conference taking place. And uh, for those of you who are here only as part of the Metadata Lab, um, a set of uh, electronic gates will come down if you try to make your way over there. Um, but uh, no, just kidding. But in fact, um, uh, I hope that in the future you'll have a chance to attend. For those of you who are attending both, uh, both uh, content and context overall as well as the Metadata Lab, I hope you get a chance to sort of move fluidly between, um, between the two and let us know if there's any way we can facilitate that. <coughs> I'm going to start with some very, very quick housekeeping. Um, one is that um, there's coffee in the exhibit hall. Is that right? Where's the exhibit hall? Right around the corner. Okay. Hey, there's coffee right around the corner. Um, so, yeah, I was able to map that metadata. So, um, lunch, there's lunch is going to be next door at 1215. Um, and there are appointments still available um, for, uh, to meet one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so you can visit Heidi at the registration table if you want to sign up for any of that. Um, just a little bit about the, it's, this is a long room, so if I see anybody nodding off back there, I'll just come back and you know, shake you around a little bit. Um, uh, the, the goal of today is to really get into um, what is the metadata, why is it relevant to what we're trying to do in K-12 through education, maybe get a little bit of a historical perspective about some of that. Some of you have lived um, through some of that. Some of you are now the recipients of the outcomes from some of that process, but I think understanding some of the historical perspective and why it's really important where we are now um, with LRMI, how it's different from some of the work that's come before. Um, we're going to start out uh, this morning um, in this first session really understanding the the uh, political implications, the implications in terms of initiatives that are happening um, at the federal government as well as at the state level, understanding how it relates to um, how LRMI, the Learning Resource Metadata Initiative, relates to uh, the Common Core and standards overall. So this, this first session um, with, uh, with this esteemed group here next to me um, is going to really give some of that larger context. Um, we'll then go into a session where we'll get down to some a little, a little bit more of the nuts and bolts um, about, so what, what is this metadata particularly? What does this initiative look like right now? Where is it going? How can you as a publisher participate? Um, what's the different roles? And we really hope, um, hopefully this will not be a shy group. Um, please don't be shy in any way. I mean, you know, the only way that these kinds of um, uh, initiatives get any traction is if we're all really engaged and take ownership and, and ask the hard questions. That's the only way this actually evolves. So, um, <clears throat> anything else? Where'd Dave go? Dave, anything else I need to say? Okay. I'm going to take that as a no. Um, hopefully you got uh, your shirts. Um, I just really think it says it all. Um, so, uh, tag me, find me, lure me. Um, so, uh, yeah, thanks, good. It was worth it just for the laugh. Um, so uh, I think you'll hopefully reflect on that throughout the day, and, uh, and it'll hopefully make even more sense. Um, today we have uh, with us for this uh, first session, um, we have with us three speakers um, who are at various places within the, within the, the world of data uh, within the Department of Education. Um, we're going to start out, I think we agreed, uh, Jack, we're going to, yep, um, with Jack Buckley, um, who is the commissioner of the NCES, the National Center for Educational Statistics. 
Um, and uh, he is currently on leave from New York University, um, uh, where he's an uh, associate professor of applied statistics. So I think the key part there that I thought of when I read this is applied. So this is not about abstractions, and I know when I took statistics, I had to derive all the equations, which really has helped me as an educational researcher, he said sarcastically. Um, it's about applied statistics and about understanding sort of the implications and how that all works. So I think that's important. Um, he's taught statistics and educational policy at Georgetown, Boston University, State University of New York at Stony Brook, um, has an extensive background in, uh, uh, in, in really making uh, things happen. So um, the second speaker we have today is uh, Ross Santi. Um, I've actually gotten to know Ross through uh, my work for 13 years on the Schools Interoperability Framework um, uh, 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 Board, and Ross has worked closely with that group. Um, and Ross comes to the department after serving four years as co-founder and head of the information and operations at a project called Just for Kids, which if you're not aware of, um, was, is really an innovative project around trying to get access to the right kinds of data to inform uh, learning and understand what our, what's happening in our schools. Um, he also was at the uh, Los Angeles County Office of Education um, as the uh, Director of Instructional Technology at Browning School in New York and a high school history teacher in New Jersey. Again, I just want to impress upon you that Ross comes from where it's all taking place. He understands the context. He understands how it fits together, both as a classroom teacher at a district level and at the federal level. So again, it's about being you know, really supporting practitioners. And lastly, um, somebody who I got to know while he was at Stupsky um, is uh, Steve Midgley. So Steve Midgley um, uh, served at, uh, at the Stupsky Foundation for six years designing and implementing grants for technology in K-12 education. So translation, he saw lots of stuff comes across his desk um, from all different perspectives, from all different sides. And I find that that's really provided um, Steve with really some good context for the kinds of things that he's working on now. Um, he was at the FCC where he headed a team um, to, uh, where he developed education chapter of the National Broadband Plan. So again, the larger context about how this data all hooks in. And he presently serves as an advisor to the Department of Ed in the Race to the Top, Race to the Top assessments um, and the Learning Registry. And so all of those, again, play in a role. So what you'll see is, um, giving the conceptual map here, is going from sort of big data um, down to a little bit more how that data gets used and then the implications about um, Learning Registry. What, how do these resources fit into that kind of data world and where are we going? So with that said, um, thank you again, all three of you, for being here. And let me go ahead and turn it over to you, Josh. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Get all my stuff out of here. All right, well, thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to try and figure out exactly uh, where I fit in here. So uh, as you just heard, so Ross is sort of like from the street. And then Steve is the smart guy that actually is going to tell you the things that live in your world, uh, and, and then I'm sort of the guy that's trying to figure out what are the best things to tell you. Uh, in fact, a lot of, uh, you know, my, my agency, the National Center for Education and Statistics, is actually part of IES, the Institute of Education Sciences. You know, uh, greatest hits include the What Works Clearinghouse, which is usually the way to end a conversation with education publishers, uh, pretty effectively, honestly. And so I'm happy to take any other questions about IES or anything I can, I can speak to uh, about things going on there. Um, but what I'd really like to do is, is talk to you uh, primarily about Common Education Data Standards, CEDS, or some people call it SEDS, and we're happy to, to hear it any way you, you want to call it. The, and, and the real reason why I'm telling you this is because I came in uh, back to office here about a, a year and a half ago and uh, was too stupid to realize that, that I didn't want to get involved in this. And so we just sort of <laughs> blundered right in and, and I'm just going forward with it. Uh, and, and we've ended up hopefully making a lot of progress. Uh, and I'll tell you what we've done to date and where we are going. And, and then we'll leave plenty of time for questions to the panel. So one of the things I've learned uh, by blundering into to this world is, so you heard from my background, I'm, I'm more of a traditional you know, statistician, applied statistician. And so data has a different meaning for me. Standards tend to have a different meaning for us. Metadata means something different to a lot of different people. Uh, just about everything, and standards actually has about you know, 10 different meanings to me and to other people. 
And so all of these words get thrown around, and it's really important uh, for us to, for me at least, to, to figure out when I'm talking to some, somebody new that they both understand what I'm talking about, but I actually understand how they're using the vocabulary. And I suspect that we'll, I, I will at least use the word standards probably three or four different times in my own remarks today, and, and I bet we'll hear something different here as well. Uh, I won't even touch metadata if, if I can avoid the term because of all the different things it means. And we, in statisticians, we have something else called paradata, which is probably not what you're thinking it is. Um, so, so fundamentally, what CEDS, what I'm talking about here is we have a, we have a big problem with our education data systems in the United States. Uh, it's a problem that's partly politically created due to federalism and partly politically created due to compromises necessary to uh, move anywhere on improving our data systems. And partly it's driven by inertia and just sort of, you know, a path dependent process that, that left us in, a, in an uncomfortable position where uh, one of the things that my agency does besides a lot of assessment and data collection is we fund the state longitudinal data systems grant programs, the SLDS grant program. So going back to 2006 or so, we have given out about $550 million to uh, states, to SEAs, uh, to build data systems, to build student data warehouses at the individual student, so student unit record data systems. We're actually about to announce, probably in, within two weeks, the next round of grants uh, uh, in that program. What we didn't do, which and folks uh, I recognize here have heard me say this before, what would have been really smart, right, would have been first to establish common standards for those data systems and then give away half a billion dollars to build them. Uh, you're guessing that's not what happened. Uh, so what we did was shoveled all the money out the door and then a couple of years ago said, boy, wouldn't it be nice if these systems could talk to each other so we didn't have this problem where I've got uh, SEAs, uh, you know, kids leaving secondary school in state A and I want to send his records to uh, an institution of higher education in state B, and in fact, even at the simple data element level, let alone the complete data model, uh, or, or even more complex standards, in fact, they're not comparable at all. And so you either need to convert somehow, uh, you need to, what usually happens is probably people sit and they make, you know, you email it and then they start retyping in this kid's information because we don't even have any kind of transport standards, let alone the, having the elements uh, be in common. And so we have this huge problem where you've got a bunch of systems that don't work across state lines and they don't work within states because different levels of education can't talk to each other in terms of their data systems. So you can't go from pre-K and send the kid to K-12 to post-secondary to secondary school to the labor force even if you're in the same state unless you're in a couple leading states that really have integrated these systems. And so we looked at this problem and said we really need uh, to solve even the, this, this first sort of basic issues. So what CDS is, is our attempt uh, to do this. It's a voluntary common data standard, key element there being voluntary, right? We're not mandate. This is not a federal mandate. You must use this. This is a, we're working with the field, and I'll tell you how, who in the field and how, we, how our process works, uh, to, to basically set up a common vocabulary to define elements, option sets. Uh, we, we do also uh, provide XML representation and a data model plus some tools that I'll talk about to streamline sharing and, and make uh, both make these data useful, not only in terms of you know, record keeping, matching, and, and transfer, but also for use, right? The whole point of building these systems is actually to inform policymakers and the public about what's going on in education. And if you can't build any of these bridges across levels within or across states, you can't do that. Why do we need it? I think, you know, why do we need it? We don't have it, and we need it. All right, this is the obligatory what is it not? You know, lawyers say, I have to keep this slide in. It's not required. You don't have to, if you're going to adopt it, you don't have to adopt all of it. It's not a data collection. I'm going to say that twice, right there and then again at the bottom. It is not yet an implementation, although we are working a lot of different ways to come up with uh, sort of smoothing the path to different implementations, and we are more than happy to work with anybody that, that uh, wants to implement or provide an implementation. It's not just the U.S. Department of Education, and I'll show you some of the other stakeholders, but as you can imagine, with something like this, we've, we've had to and are uh, thrilled to have been able to reach out to a really broad uh, set of stakeholders in the community. And then finally, again, it's not a data system, right? It is not a federal unit record system, which means it is not an attempt for me to collect, uh, you know, for every single individual kid in the United States their education records, which is prohibited by law in two places for me to do that. And so I'll tell you again, that is not what this is. This is a voluntary standards effort for states to use in their data systems, for institutions of higher ed to use for their data systems. It is not 
of federal Big Brother data collection. All right, so how do we do it? Well, one of the things that happened was, well, I'll get to this in a second. You know, uh, we had to do it fast because, as I told you, we're already late. We're years late. And so the only way to do this was essentially first to get together as many people uh, that have an interest in this area as we could keep in a table in, in large rooms. Uh, and then, of course, to steal as much as we could from any existing sources of standards that aren't nailed down. And so if you look through these, you're going to see a lot that looks like SIF. In uh, uh, higher ed, you're going to see a lot that looks like the PESC XML implementation for iPads, if you know anything about iPads. Uh, there, there's a lot in here that, and, and when I talk about the future, which is really important with respect to the Common Core State Standards or the Race to the Top Assessments, you're going to see a lot in there that looks like IMS and APIP and QTI and, and other uh, existing standards because there's no other way to do this without taking what works uh, already and just making sure everyone agrees that it works right for their needs. We've, uh, part of the process has involved a lot of public comment, so not only the stakeholders in the room, but bouncing things back with the field and uh, soliciting a lot of comments. And we actually have had thousands of comments over the development cycle just in the last year and a half. Um, and then, of course, uh, creating the data model, the elements, developing some tools, which I'll talk about, and an accelerated release cycle. So when I came in, uh, version one had just been completed, and version one was essentially minimal, right? We, we had spent a year in, or so and developed about 161 uh, unique data elements, which <clears throat> frankly were not even enough for, uh, to support. If, you're, if you had built a data system with just CEDS version one, you couldn't even do reporting to Eden, to EdFax, right? Your system would not have actually enabled you to do mandatory K-12 federal student reporting, let alone anything useful probably that your constituents wanted you to do with your data system. Uh, and it was all K-12 centric, except for the case of feedback reports, which was, again, sort of driving, K-12 driving the post-secondary conversation. So uh, in January, we, we did a year uh, development cycle for version two, and what we did was try and grow uh, sort of as much as possible. And so what we, we did was expand downward to early learning, upward uh, to post-sec. We're pushing forward into the labor market, uh, adult education, career and technical ed. Um, we really wanted to move beyond just sort of K-12, certainly to, to first include all the K-12 elements necessary for federal reporting, include all the post-secondary elements necessary for federal reporting via IPEDS, but this CDS is not about just reporting to add to the department. And so we wanted to use, you know, build the elements in a data model you would need for a lot of other use cases that were out in the field. Uh, and then put this together in a package that gives you tools and lets you see the, the, uh, the entire system and, and what it means and how you might use it. I mentioned stakeholders, right? So again, you can't build data standards uh, and have them stick without getting broad support from the field. We uh, had representation that, you know, people that came in person and participated in a lot of WebExes and back and forth from SEAs, uh, from local education agencies. As, as you folks know, if you work uh, with any states, in a lot of states, the leading people thinking about data systems are actually in the bigger uh, districts and not necessarily in the state education office. It really varies a lot depending on the state. And some of the smartest people out there with the most experience are actually not in the state house. They're, they're down the street in some other local large city. Um, higher ed is a bigger issue uh, because, of course, in the U.S., you know, yes, you've got large state public systems and it's easy to find those folks, but then you've got thousands of little, you know, some not so little uh, individual institutions of higher education. And so we had to bring as many of those folks to the table as we could. And this was a place where people thought the politics were going to be difficult. Uh, and, and they've actually been surprisingly not so difficult so far. And I think it's because we, the, the, you know, sort of the wedge in the door here was using iPads as the case study. So if every single uh, institution that's eligible for Title IV, so either uh, Pell Grants or subsidized lending from the government, which is basically every large or even small uh, institution of higher ed in the U.S. and some not in the U.S., um, since they all have to report to IPEDS, it's mandatory, they actually had an interest in, in this. And we're, we've been able to keep individual, you know, private schools, for example, representatives from private colleges, uh, both two-year and four-year, involved in the process. Obviously, a lot of people from my department, our department, has, have been involved. Uh, you know, Ross, because what's driving a lot of the burden out there is, is reporting uh, around Title I requirements to EdFax and Eden. Uh, Office of Education Technology, because they've got a deep interest in standards and LMRI, as you're going to hear more about. Uh, on the post-sec side, you know, FSA, Financial Student Aid, 
sort of federal student aid, is uh, huge. It's the, it's the largest single expenditure in the uh, department in any given year because the Department of Education is really fundamentally the department of giving money for kids to go to college. And so, and, the, and FSA operates a lot of data systems and need to be involved in this process. It's not just ed, though. Across the government, we've been working with HHS because when you move down to early learning, in a lot of states, early learning is not considered an education program as much as it is a health uh, program. And so you have to deal with state HHS type offices and the federal folks there. And then we still remain interested in making sure that, that our data systems can link out to long-term labor market outcomes. So we've been working with our own uh, Department of Labor as well as some state folks. As I mentioned, it's impossible to do this without the support of uh, standards organizations, and so we've been working with SIF and PESC and IMS uh, and, and others. And then, of course, uh, with associations, the Council of Chief State School Officers, uh, SHEO, the State Higher Education Executive Officers Association, and foundations. Uh, in fact, foundations were involved in trying to kick the government in the pants at the beginning of this. Uh, so Gates, of course, and also the Dell, the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. This is what it looks like, uh, the website, that is. So if you go to ceds.ed.gov, you will see this page, hopefully updated with something new on the bottom in terms of news and resources. Uh, and you can go and click and actually view the entire model. You, and if you want to look at, at CEDS as it stands in version 2, you can view it three different ways. You can look at it element by element. You can look at it by relationships in terms of a, a model. And you can actually, uh, what, where people have been most interested is, is in a... Uh, alignment tool where you can start to look at where uh, states, for example, will input their own data dictionary and then you can compare to CEDS, how do your elements match up, uh, you know, are your option sets different, uh, is something different about what you're doing, what would be necessary to change, and then you can actually use CEDS as a common language to compare, for example, two states and say, look, we, these guys define uh, race ethnicity this way, we do it that way, CEDS is in the middle, and here's how, you know, those linkages would work. Again, sort of just the basics, this is what an element looks like. The example here is Hispanic or Latino ethnicity, which was updated in version two from what it was in version one. Uh, if you're clicking and viewing the standards by uh, the element view, you would see the definition, the option set, which different domains it applies to, and what entities in those domains it applies to, and some related use cases, as well as a really simple XML representation, which is not shown here, but is shown there at the bottom. The, uh, sometimes it's easier to view this as a logical data model, uh, which we provide sort of two different representations. There's a domain entity schema and a normalized data schema. Uh, again, depending on your use case, you may find one of those more useful than the other. This is an example of what the entity relationship diagrams look like. Again, these are all on the website if you really are fascinated by how different data elements link together and really would like to view it this way. This is an expanded view where you can actually see uh, what we were showing you there a second ago. This is sort of a person name, health, family. Uh, so the entity here is a, is a person and it's trying to show the connections for the different elements, how they play together. This is the tool I was just describing. Uh, there's really sort of two major tools that we're working on. This one is already out in the field. Uh, if you heard anything about CEDS in the past, we used to call this the alignment tool. Now it's been rebranded as CEDS Align, because that sounds more, less like a tool, I guess. I don't know. I don't, I, you know, when people suggest these things, I just say, okay, go ahead. Um, as long as the tool does what, what I wanted it to do in the first place, I don't really care what they call it. So this is a tool that, again, allows uh, potential users, say somebody sitting at an SEA that owns one of these large data warehouses, to import their data dictionary and then compare and align themselves both to CEDS and then via CEDS to other, uh, other folks' data models, data uh, elements. And then you can analyze their data in relation also to other efforts. So you can imagine um, you know, a use case like reporting to Complete College America. You may want to see how uh, the elements that would be necessary if you, if you wanted to use your student unit record system in a college to report to CCA what are the CDS elements that you need, and then how do your elements line up to those elements uh, that, that one would actually need to do that use case. And related to that is this tool, which used to be called uh, the CEDS Use Case Generator, but now is called CEDS Connect, and actually I fully support that, that rebranding, um, which is, is more like the latter case I was talking about. So it allows you to 
or will allow you to look at uh, potential really useful things. So for example, we've been working with some of the leading states who have uh, policy relevant tools. So not just high school feedback reports, but other uh, modeling tools, for example, where they're using their state uh, student unit record data to do really useful things like, for example, here's one that we should talk about. Uh, you may have noticed that the, the Brookings a few a month or so ago suggested that states should use their student unit record system data to uh, analyze the efficacy of curriculum materials. So imagine you are a state and now I've got, uh, I know my data system has a field for what curricular material you're using in Algebra 1 in a given school. And I'm talking about material in this case, like a textbook, what published curriculum material. Well, in the old days, this is, this is a little bit ironic because it's the same guy, it's Russ Whitehurst, right? So in, in the old days, what Russ would have told you is that curriculum material needs a randomized controlled trial to be submitted to the What Works Clearinghouse to meet the evidentiary standards of what works. Now in Brookings, what Russ is suggesting is why don't states uh, take advantage of this growing amount of data and do some sort of you know, quasi-experimental analysis, so use an econometric model, for example, to model the effect of different curriculum materials, published materials on uh, student growth. Again, this is not a government recommendation. This is coming from a, a think tank. But that would be the kind of use case that CEDS would be designed to try and help states to learn from each other if someone is starting to do this successfully. A state like Florida, which has talked about it, or at least seems interested, or a state like Virginia, uh, which also seems interested from conversations, as they record more information about the materials used in the classroom, uh, that information can be used for more than just inventorying and making sure that they've ordered the books in time. And what we're going to see is an expanded use of these systems as we build the elements that we need to use them correctly. So we are in the middle of a, a same aggressive development cycle for version 3. So as soon as uh, January 31st rolled around and we released version 2, I think we took two days off and then we started version 3. And in three, we're really trying to expand early learning, which is supporting the department's push for uh, the Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge, the RTTELC. Uh, we are doing some pretty important stuff in K-12 that I'll talk about, and trying to expand post-secondary beyond just iPads to some of these other cases like Complete College America and the, the VCA. The workforce, uh, we continue to, to try, although that is harder uh, than any of these other areas. Honestly, labor systems are different. It's sort of a different bunch of, of players there, uh, but we're, we're bringing them in. Uh, and then we've been really interested also in making sure that our data elements and models support what we need in our systems for CTE. And adult education is also one that people are interested in, but it's hard to find uh, the right people necessarily to, to sit in the room for that. As part of the K-12, what I really would like to, to end up with is here is just to talk to you about two really important areas. Uh, they're really all around assessment and learning, and this is why I think I fit in. This is the part where I guess I fit in the most with the rest of the, of the panel and, and what you're doing, is sort of how can we at CDS uh, help with the standards that we need to support the next generation of assessments, both the Race to the Top or Common Core State Standards Assessments that the consortia are funded by the department, but also, in general, formative assessment in the classroom. What kind of standards do we need or what needs to be standardized uh, in your data systems to support using these data systems at a much more granular level for tracking instruction and, and figuring out what works at the, at the student level? And so, really, I'm talking about trying to expand the standards to cover formative assessment and teaching and learning, trying to support some of the existing teaching and learning initiatives that are out there, uh, and of course, we're always very interested in making sure things like uh, you know, a student wants to hit one button and export their records and make sure that those are portable. And that's something the department is deeply interested in. Steve can talk about, I'm sure. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, support for the what we call in the department the Race to the Top Assessment Consortium, but most people think of as the Common Core State Standards. All right, so this is a really silly, sort of simple model about inside a classroom. We've got standards. We've got feedback that needs to get back to kids. Uh, the instructor has to make decisions around this learner, and then the assessment is the tool that's driving the collection of data. And here's some balloons. Right, what does CDS potentially have to do with this? Well, around formative assessment in this cycle, we need to figure out what elements need to be added to CDS and structures to support standardized formative assessment data systems in the classroom. And here again, you know, as I told you, we borrow and steal anything that's out there working. And so if somebody's got, you know, a, a, LMS uh, with much of this problem solved and the IP is, is open, then we will say, you know, if we can get the rest of the stakeholders to agree that that works, this should be the standard, then we're done. It's not usually that simple, especially in this area. 
So much of this work may not get finished uh, in version three, but we're pushing as fast as we can. Around formative feedback, again, the question is what kind of process measures need to be CEDS elements? What's useful uh, in, in using these systems, these uh, learning management systems uh, that needs to be standardized? So for example, what kind of uh, uh, elements do we need to show what, when the assessment gets distilled back into to the kind of progress that the kid is making? On the standard side, and this is really where we touch on LMRI, the, the third sort of counterclockwise balloon is talking about, for example, what kind of data elements do we need to describe structures like learning progressions? Learning progressions, of course, if you believe in them, there's pretty good evidence uh, academically, at least around mathematics. I'm not, personally, this is not speaking on behalf of the department, I'm not as convinced in the evidence around ELA that we really understand the learning progression there. It's a lot harder, I think, to assess reading and writing, and it's harder to specify the, the simple learning progression. But what we're doing, what we want to do is follow the field here, and as people you know, reach the determination that this is actually you know, a scientifically valid learning progression, then we need to figure out within that progression what kind of elements do you need to show where the kid has achieved, or where have they attained in that progression. That's just an example, right? There are other criteria for success, and now we get down to curriculum, right? Unit and lesson plans. So either we're talking here about published curriculum materials, what kind of standards would we want? But as you are all aware, you know, there's a, a growing push within states and, and elsewhere to get down you know, below the published curriculum material down to sort of micro level or more granular components of curriculum. You can imagine being able to purchase online, you know, tagged with something like LMRI, different chunks of curriculum and putting them together as you want to in your, in your classroom or in your district. And we need to make sure that our data standards in the system support that use. And so whatever it is that is, is going on in that marketplace, I don't want to be behind it. Uh, and then lastly, of course, there's the related content about metadata. And, and here's where we say, if LMRI works, which it appears to, why would it, we're not going to reinvent that, right? If that becomes the standard, if we can all agree that's the standard, I don't care if you call it CDS or not, I can just draw a line around it and say that part is done, and that's what should be in your data system. Um, the very last thing we're trying to do is step on anything that works. What we're trying to do is find the pieces that don't work where people haven't reached agreement and force the agreement there as, to the extent that we can. Which brings us really to the biggest challenge this year, uh, in my opinion, trying to come up with or, or facilitate the field in developing standards around the race to the top assessments, Common Core. There is a task force, the Assessment Interoperability Framework Task Force that uh, had been created by folks in the field, so SIF and IMS and, and a lot of district people uh, and, and states and others, uh, you know, folks from vendors that, that are represented here. Uh, that started this work, but it was all voluntary and unfunded and it didn't go anywhere real fast. And here what I'm talking about, of course, standards are more complicated than the data element in the model. Because if you can imagine having 40-something states deliver two different assessments that have to be comparable across state lines, that have to be, uh, you know, that data in next generation assessment has to be uh, transferred and transmitted to the classroom and back, that we need to figure out what kinds of uh, uh, different accommodations a student needs when they sit for an assessment, that that data needs to be exchanged with a common uh, you know, framework and format, that there's standards here well beyond uh, sort of the simple stuff in CEDS versions one and two. And we're not the best, within the National Center for Education Statistics, where I have a bunch of statisticians and people who have an education research background, we're not, you know, I've got like one and a half IT people and we're not the people to develop these standards. So what we are are the people to pay to make sure that other people sit at the table and don't leave before they develop these standards, and that's what we do. Uh, and so what we did is essentially see the existing uh, AIF people and say, okay, now you're, congratulations, you're now part of CDS. Uh, we'll keep paying for you to do this as fast as you can, and, don't, and you're not allowed to leave. Uh, please don't leave. I guess it's more accurate. <laughs> and so what we did was looked at what, what was needed and what already existed, and uh, you know, are pushing to basically wherever possible, wherever we could reach agreement, wherever those folks can reach agreement, we will say, okay, that's the standard. So APIP works and it's got what we need, then APIP is the standard for this chunk. And here's, here's a map. This is not uh, published yet, but it's about to come out online on the website probably in the next week or two. Uh, and so what I'm actually trying to show you here in a format where you can't read it is uh, all of these little arrows, there's 19 of them, I think, so there are 19 different uses or use cases where we think we need, we know we need standards in order for the race to the top assessment system to work. So if we want to deliver computer administered next generation assessment, we need to standardize across at least 19 areas. So some of these are, are elements, you know, or model, but a lot of these are different kinds of transport, there's serialization, there's storage, 
uh, data at rest in places here. And so what we've essentially done is, is uh, you know, we're about to put out the AIF document that sort of the, explains what these different areas are. And then we've got another document which is each one, enumerates each one of these use cases and either suggests this is the existing standard that we think meets this requirement, which, is the, which thank God, is, is the majority of these cases. There is a standard out there that this AIF task force uh, has reached consensus on for the majority of these cases. Then there are a couple that there's a dispute about which of the existing standards. We think that one or both or three existing standards would probably work, but we haven't reached consensus on it. And that's, all of this is going to be open to public comment. That's why I'm bringing this up. So if you disagree, you know, what we want to do is hear everybody. And then there are a couple areas where there's just nothing that exists, right? So there's, not, there's no disagreement because nobody has a standard there, and that's where we can focus our, our development efforts. And so what we hope to do is we'll get comments on these and have our first big in-person meeting with this, our, our first under CEDS, although the AIF has met in person before, task force, uh, and then start to hammer out you know, both the agreement on the ones that there's a disagreement on and the other uh, you know, development, who's going to develop the, the missing pieces. Again, this will be public uh, momentarily, but you can see the kinds of things that are involved in delivering next generation assessment. There's you know, the item banks, there's the test banking, there's the delivery system where you try and do a registration and administration, P and P, um, how you present, right? But then there's a whole analytics and scoring system because these are computer administered and at least one of the two consortia is still promising to deliver a fully computer adaptive assessment, which means you need an online scoring algorithm that has to be standardized across states. And you've got to be able to deliver real-time uh, scoring as the assessment uh, progress continues for that kid. And then, of course, we've got reporting. There's analytics. There's the operational reporting. Somewhere there has to be a data warehouse for these kids to store this stuff. It has to be transferable to, and matchable to the state uh, SLDS for their accountability systems to report to Ross. Uh, maybe they've got a growth model because they've got a waiver or something. They need, the system needs to support that. Uh, and then and this data still has to filter back to the classroom and to the, to the district so that it can be useful and not just sit in a warehouse someplace. So all of these things need standards. I'll stop there because that's enough, I think, for me. But and I think we'll, we'll just talk and we'll do questions. All right. So after all that, <clears throat> um, my role at the department is certainly different than Jack's in that um, as much as we're not able to run and, and as he mentioned prohibited in at least two places from holding a unit record data system that has student level micro data that we could mine and understand what's going on, we're prohibited from doing that. But it doesn't stop the policy and program leaders of the department from asking the types of questions probably best answered by mining a lot of student level data. So we've got to define out a bunch of questions and a bunch of standardized aggregated statistics that we want to go collect from states. And what we know, as Jack mentioned, is in the past six years, every state has made some level of significant progress on the development of their statewide longitudinal state data system. So they are pulling from student level data a lot more than they used to. Most federal collections six years ago, 10 years ago were coming to us from aggregate numbers that were coming up from LEAs to state education agencies. The state education agency would kind of package it all up together and then send it up to us. But now they're really pulling from the student level data. We're not necessarily asking questions any differently though. And that's one of the things that EdFacts has been trying to do and talk to the programs about is now that we know states are working off a bank of student level data, longitudinally linked student level data, how should we be asking different questions for po program purposes, policy purposes, et cetera? So just for a little bit of background and a walk through with enough time for Steve to kind of take this to its next logical place. Um, EdFacts is the department's initiative to consolidate and streamline collection of pre-K through 12 demographic performance and outcome data. So we started with all the federal formula programs, everything where we grant large amounts of money down to the state education agencies. They in turn subgrant most of that down to the local education agencies. Title I, IDEA, we worked with um, Perkins on the secondary measures that are there. You get into also Title III, Title II, a whole bunch of other programs and other things that are in there. So. Our core mission is to work with the states. We don't work directly in fact, with local education agencies. We work with the state education agencies to collect, define, collect, validate, and then put to use a, fit, a set of data that's fit for use internally and then with the public. 
So at the same point, we're always trying to improve our governance, our communications, make sure the right hand of the department knows what the left hand of the department is doing, where data and outreach to state education agencies is concerned. We haven't been necessarily all that good at that in recent years. We're trying to get significantly better. Um, <clears throat> Just to give a little bit more context to what Jack mentioned, it's his program, so I don't want to say too much about it, but we've been granting a lot of money. A half billion was the number that was used to state, uh, states for their longitudinal data systems. 41 states and D.C. have all received at least one grant. Some states have received two. A couple states have even received three different grants. But the systems being built with those, with those funds are intended to enhance the ability of states to efficiently and accurately manage, analyze, and use education data. They, at the state education agencies, are moving from that position of, yes, we gather up a lot of numbers from districts, we put them in a binder, and we send the final answer on, to actually managing student-level data. Because they're getting asked by state legislatures, by governors, by a lot of people, to really understand what's happening in education in the state. Key driver of this in recent years is, of course, is my state a good place for a business to come do business. And they got to be able to say something about education. They got to know what's working and what's not working in education to do that. And state legislatures are asking more and more questions and, and driving a lot more out of that. So we know these systems are being built. They're trying to help districts, schools, educators, anyone else make data informed decisions, improve student learning outcomes, facilitate research, increase student achievement, and close the achievement gaps. These are all the standard things that people are now putting micro data, student level data to use for. We have to leverage that set of data better. And that's part of what Common Education Data Standards is all about. It's part of where SLDS is about, and it's where EdFacts also ties into everything. So what we keep talking about is connecting. A lot of states, when we started defining CEDS, said, you're too late. I've already built my SLDS. I don't need another map. I don't need another, I, I mean, and we just kept saying, you don't need to rebuild. You don't need to rebuild. You do need to map. The key word there is map. And the more you can understand one vocabulary and how it relates to the vocabulary you're already using within your data system, then we start to figure things out. So this is, again, a couple of things about federal reporting and version one and version two. Version one didn't have that federal reporting focus. Version two did. It was an explicit goal that Jack put on it to make sure that across iPads and across EdFacts, we could say common education data standards has what's needed. If you were to take the, the full data model, the vocabulary of common education data standards, and build a data system. Or at least map it against your own data system to find out where the gaps are. But if you had everything that's in CEDS inside your data system, you could use that data system as a source system to do your federal reporting. You could make sure that that would meet the needs. You could start automating things. You could talk with neighboring states about automation, and they've been doing that and moving all that forward. So that was really the goal of version two, get that scope broad enough that we had federal reporting covered within. So a couple examples of what we had to do in version two to get it there. So there's a lot of elements that are in CEDS that are also used in federal reporting that are in for many reasons. This is an example one, Title I targeted assistance participation, indication that the student participates in and is served by a targeted assistance program under Title I. Lots of districts were already needing that information to know how they were implementing Title I. States were needing it for a lot of reasons between how they flow out the Title I dollars, and we needed it because, in the end, we need to know the total number of students actually participating in Title I targeted assistance programs. So that data element had a lot of different use cases at a lot of different levels. One of them was federal reporting. It's probably not the only one, but I'm also not sure targeted assistance is the end-all, be-all of things district people want to know out of their data. But it is something that they already had in there. There are some things that we had to add in, really primarily because of EdFacts. And this is something that it, it, it makes sense in a student-level data system, technology literacy status in the eighth grade. That is important to a lot of states and districts because we've made it important. Title II Part D said, you've got to understand technology literacy for your students in the eighth grade. You've got to have a system to do it. And so would states on their own have picked eighth grade? Don't know. They did it because Title II Part D said you need eighth grade. So this wasn't necessarily in anybody's data system. We defined it out as part of CEDS because we knew you can't finish your federal reporting without this. And so now it's in CEDS. It makes sense, though, is the student an indication of whether the student is technology literate and a tie back to the eighth grade. There are some things that are needed for federal reporting that probably aren't living in a student level data system. Adequate yearly progress is one of these things. It doesn't apply to an individual student. It applies to a school building. 
every piece of data that we collect, since we don't touch the student level data, we touch school level data, district level data, and state level data, it is tied to a building, a school building or a local education agency. And so there are things that we need in our federal reporting that aren't student level. And they've been living and managed in various spreadsheets and people's laptops and other things at state education agencies across the country. But they weren't necessarily tied into the SLDS that was being built. We've asked states, sat there and asked, okay, so you're sure that every single student is in your SLDS? Yes, they can't be incorporated into the funding count unless they have an ID number that comes from the SLDS. I said, great, can you guarantee that you have a comprehensive list of every single school in your state inside this SLDS? And they said, no. And we went, you don't want to do that? And they said, well, we, we do want to do that, but we're still figuring that out because, and they go into the litany of reasons why LEAs create schools and they don't have a complete list and it's managed by the guy down the, work, the road who does accounting and other things and facilities over here and you know, and it was all those places, where is your SLDS connected into other systems? And that was something that CEDS I think has helped bring a lot of transparency to because by putting a couple of federal reporting things that didn't have to do with the student necessarily, some of them were teacher aggregation, some of them were school statuses, some of them were district statuses. It forced those people building the SLDS to say, well, where does that bit of data for federal reporting come from? Because it doesn't come from me. Hang on, let's go find that and let's figure out how we connect our systems. And so that's been the next piece. Just increase transparency, bring people into the discussion, hopefully in a way you can keep them at the table. So this is because Jack and I don't always co-present the same thing. This is my legal slide that just says, um, CDS is not an implementation, so we're, we're not building any tools to aggregate and to store that data at the unit record or at the aggregate level. CDS doesn't, def it defines the data elements. It does not prescribe a physical implementation. It doesn't have a data transmission technology that it is putting forward. It's not to say it can't enable all those things, but that's not what it is. It is a voluntary common vocabulary that allows us to have a lot of these conversations about where are the data stored? How are they aggregating together to make that statistic? How are they connected across systems and across states even potentially? So to give you an idea very quickly, because I know what a lot of you are probably asking is, okay, where's the data from our content area, what we publish, the programs that, that our districts are using, where does that go into EdFax and does that make it at all? And in most cases, it probably doesn't at this point, but what we're trying to do if you imagine a group of CEDS elements on the left, the yellow ones are student descriptors, the green ones may have something to do with where that student is enrolled, and the blue ones have something to do with classroom and course descriptions. And then on the right, we've got a couple EdFax data groups. These are examples of real data groups. Student membership, simple one that we need to know on or about October 1st, where was the student, how many students were enrolled and in membership at schools, at LEAs, by grade, by sex, by race, ethnicity. So if you're going to build that, you've got to pull from a bunch of CEDS elements and create an aggregated statistic. The same point, well actually probably about a month later because it's somewhere between October 1 and December 1, you're going to be doing your IDA child count and you're going to be doing that by disability and by education environment. What disability is the student identified with and where are they sitting? Are they in a regular classroom 80% of the time? Are they in a specialized setting more than 40% of the time? These are the types of things needed for reporting under IDEA. And so that's going to pull from a slightly different set of those common education data standard building blocks. You're going to get into some of that classroom environment. You're going to get into a little bit of the school enrollment. You're still going to need to know things about the student. And same thing in migrant education where we need to understand, and this is a tough one because you think about the very nature of the migrant education program, they probably are enrolled in a bunch of different schools, a bunch of different districts, one student possibly cross states, that's where it gets very complicated. And so we know that those are pulling together from right now kind of a smaller pool because we're asking just the question, how many students are benefiting from the migrant education program? But it's the laws, the business rules behind all of that that come and become a little bit more complicated. We've been able to bring a certain amount of transparency to date. What we're trying to do is use common education data standards to really bring more transparency to what we mean when we say total number of students participating in the migrant education program over 12 months. When should that start? When should that end? We've had that. But what about the student who enrolled here, dropped out here, re-enrolled here, picked up here? You know, how do we want to work that? We're working back and forth with states to understand and keep bringing more and more to that. But that's what we've been doing with CEDS. We've mapped the data groups in their aggregate 
over to the CEDS elements, which isn't really the align tool Jack mentioned. It's more of the connect tool, because it's a use case. The use case is you've got to use your elements to build up one statistic, put it in a file, and report it to the US Department of Education. So we've mapped every single data group. We've taken the definitions that we wrote with the program offices, who were very good at, OK, what's, what question did you need to ask the states for reporting? Oh, well, we need to know how many kids are enrollment. We then break that down. OK, what does that mean from a data system perspective? Let's think about something where states are going to be querying a system. You need to know it by this group, by that category. Do you need that cross-tabulated? What does that mean? Do you need a subtotal? Do you need, we, we need to get a grand total. How, how do we define all these things? But then it's a matter of taking all that, which has that discussion of common education data standards in it, and putting it out for the field. Because if I were to say to a grouping of six states. You can't do student membership without these six elements. I'm probably going to get at least one state who goes, I use a seventh. Is that OK? And it probably is, because everything is driven by state definitions in a lot of cases. There are a lot of places in our aggregate definitions where we've had to say, as defined by the state. And that makes everything very complicated. It usually makes things a lot less comparable. But it's the world of federalism across K-12. So the initial mapping associates common education data standards elements. It doesn't write out an algorithm. It doesn't say, take A, add B for all instances where date enrolled is not later than October 1, divide by C equals statistic. I think the field can have that conversation, and that's what we're trying to empower and enable. We're going to say, you can't do it without these six. And then let the field discuss how comparable their different models are of getting from building blocks to a statistic. So we've mapped the CEDS 2.0 elements to EdFacts. We know which ones, if you back in the thing, if you go dive into CEDS, you can always see which ones are in the CEDS and be, with that tag that says, this gets used somewhere within EdFacts. Right now in the main definition, the main data model, it doesn't say which data group. It doesn't say how many times within EdFacts. That's what we'll be putting into the connect tool as we go forward. But that does not define the EdFacts data groups as indicators within the CEDS structure. So we haven't said membership is a thing reported to the department that always equals A plus B divided by C because of all the state flexibilities, because of a number of things in place. And so we are working with the states and working with the National Forum for Education Statistics and CCSSO's IMAC group, that's the Council for Chief State School Officers, to try to grow this conversation over time. Because we know the exact process that SEAs are using is always a little different. It has to remain different because of state flexibilities and other things. So we're trying to make sure LEAs and SEAs can use common education data standards. Get that consistent definition, that structure of data elements that's used within and among states on the individual student level data. And make sure that that is the elemental building block. Verify that unit level data. It's needed for reporting and hopefully for other purposes. And it's within the SLDS. We get a lot of questions. My office gets a lot of questions from policy leaders, especially in the past two months as we've been working with states to grant them flexibility under Title I, right? Everybody's had to make adequate yearly progress determinations that said, did enough of your students meet their proficient bar that you set way back when? And now we're saying, wait a minute, we're going to give you a lot more flexibility in that. As soon as we do that, the need for metadata goes through the roof because every single state is defining something that says, well, I'm going to actually pull this lever down a little bit, or this, this target down for this group. So if, if you were a student who was below the 50th percentile, or you were, you were not proficient, and you were way, way below, but you made this much progress, that's enough progress for the year. But if you're in this group, it's going to be different. And so everybody's models are becoming different. Nothing's going to be comparable. We're increasing the amount of metadata that we need to know about how they're translating student assessment results into accountability determinations, because it's going to change and it's going to be different. Behind all of that, is the key question that my boss, the Assistant Secretary for Policy, keeps driving home, which is we're letting states focus on the 5% of schools they're identifying as the most important and the, the ones that they need to keep the most attention to. What's happening in those schools? What do we understand? What interventions are in place? What actions are taking place in those schools? What are they doing? Because over time, we need to know from a policy perspective, from a federal perspective, is it making a difference? 
we're not, from a federal perspective, ever going to be collecting data or working with data granular enough or timely enough to understand formative assessment to final assessment, progress during the year, individual student growth. That's for districts to know and manage and do a better job with. Some states are starting to wrestle with some pilots in that area. But at the federal government, we're asking the question, if you put all your focus on these schools and something's happening, what'd you do? Because that's what we want to know. Those are the models we want to try to find and keep growing. How can we incentivize the models that are working and disincentivize the models that aren't working? And how do we do it all by collecting a set of data, hopefully, without putting a huge burden on all the states, districts, and schools to get us what we need? So it's kind of a weird position right now. Everybody's granting, we're granting a lot more flexibility. Everybody's expecting more. But we don't really know what data we want to ask for in the midst of all that. And I'm trying to bring. As much as we can, we're trying to bring common education data standards into the conversation with policymakers. And you can imagine how quickly eyes glaze over when you get a bunch of policy people together and start talking about metadata and data standards. But we're trying to keep them there because if they can focus on here's what's in the common data standards, here's what states are already working with and rooting into their systems. Let's not go way off far afield and create something brand new. Let's look at this and talk about how this data, these sets of information could be aggregated differently. How could we look at them more, more longitudinally than we do now, since really there's only about three things that we collect that actually depend upon longitudinal statistics. The rest are kind of annual snapshots. How do we get that? Because I think we'll get more meaning from that. I think we'll get a lot more information from that. That's going to help the policy and program leaders of the department, not defining some brand new crazy question way off in the left. So that's where we're trying to go. We're trying to get the program offices to put better guidance together, be able to very specifically say and, and show that they understand to the states what makes up that final question that they've asked and that thing they're getting data for. So we want to get that detailed conversation about what elements are already implemented with state data systems and keep that at the core of the conversation that says, yeah, my old performance measures aren't working for me. I need new things. I need to ask about new stuff. Well, that's fine. But let's ask about new stuff that's a rearrangement of all the same elemental building blocks. Let's rearrange them better. Let's not ask people to go buy a new set of blocks. Because at this point, they've all built data systems. They're connecting them. I'm not going to win every single argument with the program about not causing new blocks. I mean, it's going to happen. But we're going to try and keep that minimal and be really explicit and, and know that that's what we're doing when we do it. So our next steps within the department, use common education data standards to manage a better process for designing our new reporting elements. We have to go out the door later this year with a new information collection package that'll govern the 13-14 school year, and hopefully the two years after that if we can get a full three-year clearance. So we want to define that very explicitly around common education data standards. Again, not putting an algorithm out there, not saying A plus B divided by C, but saying, here's the question, here's the building blocks, and here's as much guidance as we can give you about that, those building blocks, where we feel you have flexibility as a state and where we actually feel you don't. So we're going to keep evolving in that direction to make our information clearance process and hopefully, therefore, our data collection process as a result of that information clearance better. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve, who's going to root back down to the individual states and their schools and districts, and then we'll open it up for questions. Okay. That's me. Okay, so uh, um, my presentation uh, will be about uh, learning registry, which some of you may know about, just to get um, a sense for me to know what kinds of things are helpful to talk about. How many of you already feel like you uh, understand LRMI at, at, at a pretty good level of detail. as a hand raising. OK. Um, how many of you have opened up and read XML in a text file? OK. All right, I'm good. I just, you know, I got to know kind of who I'm talking to. Um, so uh, in, in principle, Learning Registry is just a project to help us share what we know. And we've heard about CEDS and, uh, and EDFACS, which are uh, both projects essentially to do similar things, um, share what we know. But uh, Learning Registry has taken a particular approach, and it's a very uh, operational approach, and it is a, uh, it's a peer to peer approach. And so this, this presentation will sound a little bit different than some of the uh, information that, uh, that 
that Jack and Ross have been talking about, not because what Jack and Ross are working on aren't important, but because there are multiple strategies to uh, solving the wide range of problems that we have. So this is not a replacement for any of the things that we uh, have heard about up to now. This is, uh, in, in some sense, a supplement or a, a uh, a, a way to accomplish some different goals, uh, not to not to diminish or, or speak to the, the goals that, uh, that we were talking about earlier. Um, and as a matter of point, I'm working uh, pretty intensively on some of the RTTA assessment interoperability framework stuff. Uh, so uh, I'm a big believer in, uh, in, in those strategies and, and, and those data structures as well. Um, so uh, common core state standards, this is again something lots of people know about, few people know about. Okay. Um, we know that there are a lot of digital learning resources out there. Um, right now, the alignment to Common Core is scarce, so knowing which things are connected to Common Core um, are fairly scarce. Th that implies a couple of different issues. One is, uh, if I were to have a resource aligned to Common Core, and this is something as simple as a Khan Academy video, that you might see on the web, and knowing what standards it might be useful for supporting a teacher in, in, in delivering a, a lesson or, or, or a piece of learning. Uh, you have to know how to say that uh, in, in some digital format, that's LRMI, and you have to have some way of sharing that, which is once I know it, how do I tell you that I know it? And that involves a number of different components, which is who am I, right? So how do I tell you that it's me and not someone who claims to be me that's telling you that piece of information? And then how do I actually de deploy it to you in such a way that you'll be able to find it, right? The traditional model on the internet today to deploy things is with Google, <laughs> right? So I put it up on the web, Google scrapes it, and then they find 10 blue links through some keyword that directs them to that piece of content. And there's nothing wrong with that. And in fact, in the use case where that works for you, uh, you should continue to use uh, the traditional uh, web scraping models, and you should uh, use LRMI as a microdata format to enhance the Google uh, search engine. But where LRMI helps you describe a thing, but that Google doesn't index it in a way that's going to be useful for you, and I'll give you some specific examples of that, we've been proposing learning registry as a technique for enabling sharing that doesn't have to use Google as an intermediary. That's not to say we're trying to replace Google. That's not what we're trying to do. That's, I think, a fool's errand, uh, especially at the kind of um, you know, scale that we're talking about. Uh, but what we are saying is that there are many use cases where Google is inadequate for the case described, and I'll give you just some specific examples on this slide, which would be uh, a lot of states and districts deploy systems that allow teachers to interact with the system and with other teachers and with content. These are learning object uh, repositories, learning management systems, uh, in, the, in the race to the top world, uh, information, instructional improvement systems, IIS. These are all systems which don't leverage Google in any deep way, and those systems right now are essentially vertical stovepipes. They're, they're, they're just uh, integrated to themselves and not to other systems that resemble those in other states or within the same state. And the question is, what would it look like to integrate those systems so that if a teacher in one system learns something, another teacher in another system can benefit from that learning? Or if a state department makes a determination, another state department can leverage that information. Is that making sense? Right. So, in, the, in this problem domain, many state uh, departments of education are investing in aligning web-based uh, digital content to Common Core. That investment uh, can be relatively time-consuming and expensive. Uh, each state, therefore, with limited resources, each vendor with limited resources knows a little bit about this problem domain, right? If you tried to align every resource in Google to the Common Core state standards, right, that would be a problem. It's not, not a very uh, practical activity, uh, but if each one of us takes on a little piece of that, all of us can know a lot about that. You know, I'll just give you a little basic math. Uh, if 20 states align 50 pieces of content to the Common Core state standards, that's 1,000 pieces of aligned Common Core, right? So the network effect is an important concept in this, and Learning Registry is specifically just around leveraging this network effect, trying to allow us to share what we know so that we can all benefit from each other's shared expertise. This is an important policy point, which I've been learning a lot about. I've, I've sort of been taken to school in a number of different directions around, uh, around this project. And, uh, and this may be useful to vendors as you're working with states. It's certainly useful if you are from a state department. Uh, 
in this conversation about sharing, uh, there's two sides. And one side is relatively easy, I've found, in education, which is sharing what you know. A teacher walks into a classroom and says, today I'm not going to share what I know, right? <laughs> not a lot happens a after that point in time in the classroom. So education fundamentally is about sharing what we know. So giving away what I know to someone else, that's really deep into the sort of DNA of education. So that turns out to be a very easy ask. I go to a State Department, I say, if you aligned a thousand resources to Common Core, would you share them with all the other states? They say, sure, no problem, I'd be happy. Where do I put it? So that conversation has been relatively easy and we're making a lot of progress around that. On the other side, if I say, well, I have these three other states who have these 3,000 aligned resources, would you put them into your system? So, uh, well, I'm not sure I try, um, what's the process they used? Is it good for, a, right? There's a bunch of political, technical, educational problems that people experience. So my emphasis is uh, around, on this project that we need to work harder to accept the fact that other people know useful things and can, we can benefit from those things. You know, I'll tell you uh, from a perspective that buying those 3,000 aligned resources from a vendor is in fact easier than taking them for free from three states, right? And that's an interesting business model. So I'm pointing out business model here, right? Um, that's an interesting opportunity for organizations uh, because of the politics of using things from other states versus using things from vendors. Now, do I have to like that? Do I have to like that the fact that we have to sell things that are free? I don't, know. I don't really care, to be honest. If we make use of these things, that's okay. So I just want to uh, observe that as we're, um, as we're going through this. So what is the learning registry specifically? Uh, it takes a little while, as a few people in the room know, to, to sort of get the, 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 the concept across of what this is. But effectively, learning registry is a technique rooted in some technology uh, that's all open to enable computer systems to share with each other. So this is not a website where you send your teachers instead of the website that they're currently going to. It's not a website. So th these guys have some disclaimers about uh, this is not a mandated federal reporting of individualized student. Right. My sort of disclaimer, which is not uh, mandated by Congress, um, is this is not a place that you send people. So it's hard to communicate. But so I, I tell people this, and they say, uh, well, what's the log on? Right? And I was like, no, there's no logon. I don't have a, and they say, well, he doesn't like me, he won't give me the logon. <laughs> so there is no logon. You can't get here. It is a uh, infrastructure to allow systems that where the users go to talk to each other. The best analogy I can give you is if you think of Gmail and maybe you, you, you use an Outlook exchange system and then there's Hotmail. These are systems that enable you to use email. You log on to those systems, but you can send an email to anyone on any one of those other systems, right? But you don't log on to the internet email. You log on to one of these providers of email. The emails travel around using a protocol, happens to be called SMTP, that allows those messages to move between systems, right? But the user doesn't use SMTP. The user uses this login, this Gmail, that sort of system. This is the same sort of approach for educational metadata. So we're just saying there are these systems. We're not going to get all the users to log into one system. So that that's not going to happen, right? That's unrealistic for many, many reasons. But we are going to say all of these state systems, all of these vendor-provided systems could be enabled with a metadata exchange technique we're calling Learning Registry to move metadata, to move information between these systems so that as users interact on one system, they're discovering and learning from information that's flowing from other systems. Just like an email, it's not very useful to have, if, you, if Gmail all of a sudden said you can only email other Gmail users, be pretty hard to use Gmail at that point, right? You could still do a little bit, but it'd be much, much, much less useful. And that's the argument we're making around Learning Registry. Alrighty, so I'll get through the rest of this fairly quickly. Um, this is a general point, which is just to establish that we don't uh, provide any gatekeeping services around Learning Registry. Anyone can share anything they want that in involves metadata through the learning registry. We don't require specific formats, and we don't require specific quality measures. Those are determined by the provider and the receiver of the information. So uh, in that sense, the important thing that we provide is a, a identity framework so that if someone puts something into the registry, you know who that organization is vis-a-vis -vis distinguishing them from other organizations. So 
On one day, you're consuming something from a State Department of Education. The next day, you know you'll be consuming these things only from that State Department. So if you trust that State Department on day one, you can trust them on day two. You won't get spam in that channel. You can think of this similarly to Twitter. I might not know who the user you know, RFID is on Twitter. There's just some random handle there. But I know that the next day, the same person is going to be tweeting off of that handle, right? So it's, it can be anonymous, but it can be identified. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's the important component of how quality is established, the reputation of identity. All right. So what, we, what people can share are statements like this. I alluded to these all earlier. Uh, you can use LRMI to say something like, this Khan Academy video is aligned to math 8.2.1 on the Common Core. You can also say more general things. This Pearson content pack is aligned to, and then you could iterate 15 Common Core standards. So you might be able to say it's not one little tiny video and one little tiny resource, but there's this large content pack that's, that helps with these range of standards. That's, that's an important concept in education, and that's something you can communicate uh, pretty, pretty effectively uh, with LRMI as an example. Uh, this is just to establish what uh, the, the infrastructure is. So Department of Education and Department of Defense have invested alongside of a few other organizations uh, in a free open community using open source and open standards. So the technology is free and open, Apache 2 license, so you can just take it and use it in your projects. You don't need to uh, resubmit modifications that you might make. Uh, we hold uh, conference calls, we hold listservs that are out in the open, our documentation is all out in the open. So uh, even the bug tracking and, and, and uh, roadmaps are out in the open. So this project is easy to get involved in uh, and easy to, to leverage uh, to use uh, for uh, projects that have commercial intent and also uh, you know, open or nonprofit intent. I'll say it again, Learning Registry is not a website or a content repository. It's a technique for linking those sorts of systems together. And uh, it involves an actual implementation technology, so it's not just a standard. We've developed and leveraged a number of standards uh, to move data around, but we've actually given you a, a technology implementation. So if you actually want to go, I want to install this, the one you built, and use it, you're welcome to do that. Or if you want to leverage our specifications and, and documentation, you can, you can create an alternative implementation. Those are both open roads uh, if you want to get involved in this. Uh, so I'll just walk through this uh, fairly quickly to give you a sense because this can stay somewhat intangible, so I'll try to make this tangible. If you think of the learning registry, as I mentioned, like Twitter, like a timeline, it will help conceptualize how we expect people and how people are currently using it. So uh, uh, if NASA, which we work with, produces a Mars rover animation, which they've done, and puts it in the learning registry, which they've done, uh, that becomes registered as essentially a first class piece of metadata, which has got some XML descriptors, you know, what it is, the title and the location, the URL, those sorts of things. So that goes on to the registry. National Science Digital Library can consume that piece of metadata because they're subscribed essentially to the NASA channel. That's one way to pull data out of the learning registry. They subscribe to that and they find that metadata and put it on their website. So now users on the NSDL.org website can see that NASA video. That's a handy, there's, there's much simpler ways to accomplish that than learning registry, but you'll see why I think it makes sense to, to undertake this uh, using this mechanism. NSDL then makes that available to their users. They have a user on NSDL who likes that thing. And so NSDL has a custom proprietary like mechanism. They click a like or they click a favorite or a bookmark, something like that. NSDL is the only person that knows about that like at that point. Now, NSDL can wrap up that like in a piece of metadata, put that back on the learning registry to say, uh, this teacher just liked a resource, and the resource is this thing over at NASA. Uh, CTE Online can then uh, take a look at that uh, resource as well, and they can find that one of their teachers aligned it to a standard. They put that back on the registry. Uh, now, any number of organizations can observe not just the original metadata, which is it has this title, it has this URL, it has this. They can now say, oh, and CTE Online, Career Tech Ed Online, which is a California Department of Ed website, uh, has told us that it is aligned to a particular standard. Oh, and NSDL tells us that science, te science teachers like this resource, right? So now we all of a sudden know a bunch more about the resource than we did when we started. So alternative implementations can now... Uh, if, if I'm running a website in a different state, I can put up on my website not just the title and so forth, but I can put up like. It's been thumbed up, even though it wasn't thumbed up on my website, right? 
This, Facebook does this all the time, right? And we're just providing you a technical opportunity to put the kind of Facebook type interactions and the type of metadata alignment interactions that we don't have a mechanism for sharing today into, uh, into an operational framework. Does that make sense? This is just, um, that's probably too small to read a lot of it. This is just a summary of all the different kinds of, and, and, uh, and I'm, uh, I may catch a little bit of heat um, from Jack at some point for abusing this word, um, which has a technical term in his profession called paradata. We've been calling uh, this sort of activity data around learning uh, paradata. And it's a, an abuse of the term, but, uh, but it's kind of catchy, so. Um, <laughs> uh, you can see over on the, that you might have a source website which was visited. You might have usability gets rated. You might have star rating, four to five stars. You might have tags, right? You might have discussions occurring. Uh, you might have it included in a learning activity, right? So there's any number of what you can think of as verbs with uh, objects going on. So a science teacher working with ninth graders favorited this. A second grade ELA specialist uh, taught this, right? Uh, you can have any number of activities around resources that get consumed and then uh, uh, lodged onto this metadata timeline, which is the learning registry. Uh, how that gets used, uh, this is an example from uh, Brokers of Expertise, another California Department of Ed website that's been using learning registry. Uh, so as a user is trying to select a resource, they they click on learning registry selection, uh, suggestions as part of the tab and they can see the standard that's related, which is actually a California standard that's not a, um, that's not a, a, a common core state standard, but even so they can see based on favorites and other activity data, they get suggested resources that might be connected to that standard uh, coming off of the learning registry. And that's largely because of other California Department of Ed systems that are publishing into that. Okay, so that's all I have to say uh, as an overview. Um, I think we'll probably have questions for all three of us. Uh, if you, this is actually incorrect. Um, I don't know how that happened. You won't find any happiness at learningregistry.com. I don't know how I edit that. It's learningregistry, there we go, .org. Real-time correction. Thanks. Thank you to the three of you. I think I'm going to actually go register learningregistry.com, so maybe I can put some happiness there, but that's another story. Um, um, thank you um, to all three. It's very interesting when we were planning, I um, said an hour and a half. I can't imagine how we would take an hour and a half. Well, I don't know if you look at your clock right now. It's now uh, 20 minutes past 10. Um, but uh, I think it's important to, uh, I think all of the details there were important. I just want to point out that um, you know, we started from a point about looking at data in general in education, um, getting down to a little bit more detail around the state level information, and then moving down into um, learning registry. And I think um, rarely do we get a chance to look at that full spectrum around data. I think so often we think about the SLDS data being completely different from things that are particularly around informing learning. And I think that um, it was really important for this group really to get a chance to hear that full story because I think we're going to see that get woven closer and closer together if we're doing our jobs right um, in terms of really trying to help inform instruction and ask powerful questions and do those pieces. So as a, as a publisher community, I think you have to keep the CDS piece in mind even though you may not be working today with some of that data. Keep that in mind as you're building systems um, and you're looking at how you're going to handle student information, interacting with those, um, but clearly we're going to be taking um, today and moving it closer down to um, defining the actual learning uh, resources themselves. So let me go ahead and open up to any questions that people have of any of the three of our esteemed panelists here. So questions? Josh. Could um, anyone from the panel uh, address the issue of granularity for, for publishers who are publishing a full curriculum, um, which if you correlate them to standards, would have so many standards and how correlated they would be uh, not useful. Certainly we could create synopses of units and lessons and correlate individual pieces that would be searchable by Google. But how, as publishers, uh, can, can we use these systems? And, and um, 
for, for um, curricular um, products. We both care a lot about that. Yeah, I think we care about that. Um, they probably can't hear in the back. Yeah, I'm wondering, so is there? I, I, can, I can just. That'd be great. Thank you. you want to just repeat the question. Yes. So uh, I'll, 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 I'll repeat the question I want to answer. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, uh, the, the question is essentially uh, a lot of publisher uh, created materials are, uh, are uh, full solutions in, in some ways, meaning they, they cover a lot of different standards and they might include sequencing and connective tissue and lots of things that, uh, that add value beyond just this one video that you know, might be uh, aligned to a particular standard or useful for teaching a particular thing. Uh, so the, the question is, how can we use uh, systems that essentially provide mechanisms for gr creating granular structures um, when we provide full scope solutions? Fair? So uh, uh, I think this is a really important question, and I think it uh, speaks to, you know, sort of uh, a little bit of a dichotomy in education of many people pushing towards highly granular, highly choice-driven, highly classroom-based learning, and uh, a lot of uh, people who are pushing for uh, what you might call aligned instructional systems where the same system does similar things uh, in similar ways to, to provide a, a quality and consistent uh, learning uh, environment, learning opportunity for kids. Uh, and I think there's a lot to be said for both environments, so uh, I don't want to characterize it one over the other. Um, that said, I think it's important to start thinking about how to represent learning in a digital way. And that, to me, is the crucial part. So it's not about breaking apart your curriculum to say, this is something you can just take one piece and expect good results, but it is saying these pieces are connected in a digital framework. And so rather than thinking of it only as a print-based framework where the binding is the metadata, so to speak, so the, the, the pages are in a particular order and that's the metadata structure, we can start talking about multiple pathways through a curriculum. And if we start aligning resources, not just as abstract entities, right, which is a series of tags that describe that one piece, but how that piece is connected to other pieces, and crucially, and this is some work Gates Foundation has been doing, crucially, the fact that there might be multiple ways through that curriculum, meaning this might be useful for instruction passing through this way in a mainstream environment, or if a student is needing a reteach from a concept they didn't understand further down, we can bring them back to that point. So, What's important for me is there are metadata structures for describing pathways and metadata structures for describing content. And those two things have to be in place in order to, uh, I think, fairly represent your product as, a, as an entirety. And those things can be represented uh, through learning registries. So that's just a point uh, on, on, on the technology we're using. But not all the metadata structures for pathways are fully baked yet. I've seen some drafts of that stuff. Uh, but we need those structures in order to, uh, to have a full scope uh, curriculum that we, can, that we can talk about, I think, along the lines you're getting at. I, I guess I heard a different question. Uh, so, so I'll answer that one. No, the, the, there's really two, at least two parts of that question, and, and I think it's hugely important but difficult uh, to, to nail them all down. So the first one is really sort of the, something that some of us like, Brian, we, we know this to be true but maybe everyone hasn't thought about it, which is that the, any existing standards right now, and now I'll use the word standards to talk about content standards, so any existing curricular content standards are not sufficiently granular to support the kind of uses that we're talking about. So absolute sort of problem one. And what we, something we've learned uh, from the meeting that you convened that, that I was not able to attend but sent people to and that, that Steve attended and read all the minutes of is that um, you know there's a problem here that any uh, Next dive, you know, just to a level that's sufficiently more granular constitutes a major act of authorship, right? So now, if you're if you created the Common Core State Standards for Mathematics and someone wants to break those down into something that might actually be more useful for digital representation, that's not trivial. It's hard, and it's not just hard because of the pathways, which is even harder for two other reasons we can talk about. But it's just hard because you know now we're going to fight over that, and, and you're actually authoring something, and we're going to have this problem with the next generation science standards, right? Which are probably even harder because, frankly, when I assess hundreds of thousands of kids in science every two years, uh, and they, you know, just trying to nail down the content, the framework of what we're assessing in science at fourth, eighth, and twelfth grade is really, really challenging. Uh, so now imagine trying to get sufficiently granular. So that's a huge problem that has to be you know, sort of overcome. It has to be overcome by the field with a solution that everyone agrees is, is good enough. Now you throw in this other problem, which is the sequencing problem. So not only do we need metadata 
uh, to enable us to, to track a curricular sequence, I would argue th that needs to have some kind of research base, right? And I sort of touched on this talking about learning progressions. I'm saying this more as an academic now. Um, yeah, we can all put an arbitrary uh, sequence on a bunch of material, and if it's something like pre-algebra, we might even agree on maybe a, a, some set, a finite set of paths, right? But some of these other trips through the curriculum world are not going to be easy to agree on, and there may be very, very limited research about what constitutes uh, a more effective or valid even sequence. And so not only are we going to, you know, at the same time as, as folks like, like some of you all are going to be trying to solve the metadata problem, how do I tag this so that when I go to get a, a next step, these steps show up as valid and these steps show up as things that you should have had to have done, you know, before. Um, you know, where's the evidence for that going to come from, and how are we going to actually make this justifiable? And, and unfortunately, this is one of these things we're probably going to have to learn by making mistakes while we do it, because there's not enough uh, time, frankly, to wait for, and there aren't enough talented uh, people doing that research, honestly. And so what we're going to end up probably doing is making sure, the key here is making sure as you build these things, especially if you're providers of content, that you, you uh, ideally can share some of those metadata and the effectiveness, which is why this all ties back into my world in CEDS, where I'm going to be assessing these kids at the end of the day and recording those data. Because if we don't get that micro-level assessment information, we're not going to know which of those sequences work. And so as we get granular, we really need to retain those data and somehow f come up with ways to share them, even you know, breaking barriers of, of whether or not they're proprietary or how much information you're willing to share. I think that's going to be vital. I'm just going to add my two cents into that, and that is, and I'll, I'll get to you, um, is that uh, it's important that we maybe look at this also as an action research component, that we're not something that the research community is doing to schools, but in fact some way that we engage educators and even learners as part of that process. And so being able to gain access to that data and make informed decisions will be an important part of that. Question here, and then I'll get one back further. Yes? Yeah, it's a great, it's another really huge problem. So, so remember first, well, so we were just talking about sort of content standards and making them more granular. And then imagine you've got a curriculum resource that you're linking to those content standards. And you're probably, you could be linking them to more than one. Maybe you've got Texas and Virginia and CCSS math, right? And something else that, that we haven't thought of yet. That's just on the content side. Right now the question is items. And, and what's going on there. So, so the big, in my opinion, uh, you know, and I spent a lot of time also with the Race to the Top assessment teams just sort of advising the department on them. Uh, creating items is, is a huge bottleneck in this assessment process, and that's one of the reasons why, because they have to be linked to content, and they have to be pretty granular there, too. I think what's interesting about the assessment world is that people maintain this, uh, I'm not going to call it false, but they maintain a, a firewall between sort of content and that framework and the, and the curriculum material and then the assessment framework and the items that come out of that and then that's the sort of a different thing when obviously in your curriculum material you've got items for formative assessment and obviously these guys have something that looks a hell of a lot like your content framework in the assessment world and we draw a line and we pretend that they're different and that they inform each other but the only way I think that we're going to have enough items to populate you know, a, a formative slash summative and adaptive next generation assessment is if we can break through some of those barriers somehow. And these kinds of metadata initiatives that tag uh, p potentially, for example, your content and enable people to buy it per perhaps you know, at the state level per student in, in near real time or at least in chunks uh, to put in a test bank or an item bank at the beginning of the year then to formulate tests, I think that's going to be necessary. I don't know how the, the item development community is going to provide enough items uh, without the content development community working with them. I, I, it's hard for me to see, especially because what's going to happen in, you know, I worry a lot about item, uh, or rather test security, right, and test integrity and security, and if the testing window is going to be very large for the Common Core State Standards Assessments, that means we need even more items because we're going to have to burn a lot of them as that window stays open. Especially when you're dealing with taking a formative assessment September 1st, 
taking it September 30th, it's, there's a vertical scale that shows you how much growth you made. You want to understand what content was used during that period for efficacy purposes. Wouldn't, you, wouldn't vendors have to be sharing a lot more of that IP than they do today? The, so I don't want to open up the vertical scale door, although that's a good question too. I, I think it's it's clear to me, at least from reading some of the technical materials that the T, the technical advisory panels to the consortia have provided that even if we think that, that the Common Core state standards are vertical in some places, they're probably not vertical everywhere. And so we're going to have to make jumps. So let's go ahead and assume no, no real meaningful long-term vertical scaling. A lot of people disagree with that. We can, we can, that's a whole separate panel. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the short answer is even, you know, assuming we only had one consortium, we're still going to have that problem. There's going to be a scaling problem. We don't, I don't know what IRT model they're actually going to end up using. Uh, I don't know how well, you know, we, we want to do trend over time, let's say, even if it's not uh, vertically scaled, but I want to see how uh, fourth graders are doing over time in that state. I'm going to give a similar assessment. That, that's a scaling problem that I have to fix, and I have to rescale that every year. It's going to be very difficult to plug in items uh, if they've got sort of properties that don't fit in, in that model. I agree. I, I don't know how much is out there. I mean, I think if we can come up, the, the good news is, I, I haven't heard that anybody's looking at sort of radical new psychometrics, and so there's sort of a small, finite set of, of models we can think about in a, in a relatively small solution set for this problem. But yeah, it may, it may end up at the end of the day that it's not a technical problem, it's a legal problem. It's another one, yet another area in this space where it's the IP lawyers that, that matter more than the, the psychometricians, which, which I've learned is lots of areas in this space. Uh, that's why we have so many lawyers at the department. That's a good question. I had one other question I can take. Let me ask the three of you. Are you going to be able to stick around for just a little bit with us? Okay, great. So I had one more question I promised to take, and then we're going to take our break here. Just real quickly, I know I think you folks have a lot of challenges looking at this. Is, is finding the information that's out there, and I know that you made some comments about Google. Have you thought about an open source search like you've seen that could be used amongst uh, the vendors? I know we've seen this technical task as well. Yes. Uh, right, so the question is around uh, search and what technologies might be used for accomplishing search. Uh, I would never use search in, in the phrase alternative to Google. Um, I, I just think, you know, when you talk about people that consume terawatts of power every day running search, um, you, 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 there's really no alternative. Um, but if you're trying to solve a search problem in a fairly, fairly narrow domain like education with a, with, with a much smaller set of uh, items, a set of searchable elements, you can look at open source technologies like Lucene. You can, in fact, even leverage some of the Google uh, web search, custom search engine uh, uh, products to, to solve that problem. Learning registry, which is a really important point here, is not a search technology. It's a distribution technology and a discovery technology with an identity framework to allow you to do this uh, not just on the worldwide fuzzy web, but specifically associating particular levels of quality with particular submitters and so forth. So uh, it's very relevant. And in fact, there's a vendor in the room who has been working uh, over at Agilix uh, uh, who has been working on dumping learning registry metadata, which comes in a stream, right, it's a distribution framework, over into Lucene Solar. So I believe that's specifically their strategy. So that's, that's one group. And uh, we did a hack day where we took uh, learning registry data uh, as an experiment and put it into Amazon, uh, uh, the cloud search engine that they've uh, opened up recently, which is an extremely powerful tool not to be advocating one or another, just observing there are lots of ways of taking metadata that's flowing in from l large numbers of sources and injecting it into something that has the ability to provide search capability, and Lucene is certainly one of them. Great. Well, we're going to take a 15-minute break, and I know we're running about five minutes behind, but, uh, you know, better use of the time could not be made than have this discussion. So feel free to, to uh, chat with any of our speakers, and we'll be back in here at 10 minutes to the hour. Thank you so much. Thanks, you guys. That was great.